Hey everybody, I'm Ethan James with TheHonestCarpenter.com. For this week's video, I've got something a little different for you than usual. I teamed up with Logan Parker, founder and owner of Heirloom Builders in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, and an old friend and associate of mine. Logan is a very unique and impressive person. A self-reliant frontiersman and family man, he represents a growing number of Americans who have bucked the trend of modernization and instead dedicated themselves to a simpler lifestyle living off the land and off the grid. Logan's construction company, Heirloom Builders, focuses solely on building green homes. And when I say green, I'm not referring to just the usual standards that have evolved to improve energy efficiency in houses. No, in terms of sustainability, Logan's homes are in a class of their own. And none of his projects better exemplifies his dedication to green building than the one he lives in, this modest homestead just outside of Pittsburgh. At first glance, Logan's house may only catch your eye because of its unique shape. And the other various structures that dot his property could easily be written off as a sprawl of storage buildings. But, peel back the layers of this small estate, and you'll find a home so efficient so highly logical that it may not have its equal anywhere in America. A truly unique labor of love, ingenuity, and dogged perseverance, it deserves to be seen by anybody who has ever wondered just how green our homes and our lives can really be. So get ready to see nine things that you need to know about Logan's construction marvel. This thing's gonna blow your mind. But I'll say real quick that Logan and Heirloom Builders now have their own YouTube channel. I'll link it here, in my end screen, and in the description below. Logan will soon be covering a wealth of topics about sustainability, homesteading, and green construction. You're not going to find a more informed, reliable teacher anywhere. So be sure to subscribe now while he's just ramping things up. Alright, let's get going. Number one, much of Logan's house really is made of straw. As you enter the home, the first thing you'll notice is that the walls are incredibly thick. It especially shows up in these rounded, bullnose corners beyond door jams and windows. This depth exists because the walls primarily consist of stacked straw bales. See, the superstructure of the house is timber framed, or built in the post and beam style that you see in a lot of mountain cabins. But, the space between posts is densely packed with straw bales that are notched to hug the framing and provide a continuous interior and exterior surface. So why'd Logan do it this way? Because straw is a fantastic natural insulator. The weave and heft make it highly efficient at preventing thermal loss through the wall. And, more importantly, straw is just outrageously cheap. It's just an agricultural byproduct, and it can be acquired in large quantities for minimal cost. All of Logan's straw came from a nearby farm. Staked down onto 4x4 plates and suspended over a gravel infill, the bales span the distance between timber posts and beams as efficiently as any framed wall. And it installs quickly as well. Logan and a small crew set all the bales for the house in just a day and a half. So, using straw bales kills two birds with one stone. It creates mass between structure and simultaneously insulates the home. But, all walls need some sort of cladding. That's the material that provides a visible, finished surface. So, what did Logan use? Clay. Earth and clay plaster was troweled onto the finished straw bale walls to seal them up. And it's not just any clay. This is the clay that was dug up during the lot excavation for the house. The material didn't go anywhere, it just came up out of the ground and stayed right on the job site until it could be used. This is a hallmark of sustainable building, and a trend you'll come to recognize in all of Logan's work. The clay was sifted through screens to remove large aggregate, then wetted down and mixed with a variety of agents, including sand, linseed oil, boiled wheat paste, and even cow manure. It was then troweled onto the wall by hand. Upward of 40 volunteers helped with this stage in a big work party. This process happens in multiple layers though, with the wall gaining thickness and evenness each time until a final smooth surface coat can be floated on. And the exterior of the house required a slightly different finishing touch. In order to create a surface impenetrable to water, Logan used a thin coating of lime, about an eighth of an inch thick, you can see the edge of it in this small area that needs patching after some damage to the side of the house. You can even see the hand scoops where deeper layers were troweled on. With all these layers in place, you could hose down these walls and they'd repel water as well as any painted siding. The hardened lime is that effective, but it's also caustic to skin and lungs, so it needs to be applied with protective gear. That's how the home's surface works. Now let's move back inside. And in case you didn't catch it the first time, I'll remind you again right now, Logan's house is completely off the grid. Nothing comes in from the city and nothing goes out. Not water, not waste, not electricity. The house is isolated, cut off, and self-sustained. The processes that make this possible are complex and numerous. And they're also highly integrated with one another. So to speak of one, you sort of have to speak of the other ones as well. Let me try to break it down for you here. The third thing you should know about Logan's house is that it contains some serious batteries. Within this handsome flip-top bench, made by Logan of course, you'll find eight six-volt batteries run in series parallel to create a 24 volt battery bank. These deep cycle batteries store the power that Logan and his family use for their LED lights, fans, and various appliances. 
The power for these batteries is drawn entirely from eight photovoltaic solar panels on the roof. They're pitched at a 40 degree angle to collect maximum sunlight year round, especially in winter when the sun is low and days are short. The collected solar energy from the panels comes through this charge controller and gets fed into the deep cycle batteries. Their total collection is only about a quarter of what most smaller houses will use, but Logan's house doesn't need much. His appliances are hand selected for their low energy requirements, such as this efficient washing machine and this crazy refrigerator. Look, the thick walls maintain maximum insulation and the unique top mounted condenser prevents heat buildup that most refrigerators suffer from. This whole thing only draws as much power as a dorm room fridge. Their stove doesn't take electricity or gas. It's an Italian-made wood cook stove with pull-out burner eyes and an oven compartment big enough to cook a turkey. In the winter, this wood-burning stove certainly helps heat the house. But if you never lit it up, it wouldn't even matter because Logan's home has no problem heating itself. And this is where things get really crazy. Most homeowners spend the majority of their utility bill on water heaters and furnaces. It's just pricey to heat things up any way you cut it. But for these same utilities, Logan spends a grand total of nothing. Not a cent. He doesn't even have to burn anything. His heating, like his electricity, is completely free. So just how does he produce it? Number four, solar thermal heat. Up on the roof, you'll notice two slightly larger panels. These are solar thermal collectors. The panels contain cylinders full of liquid, which is being passively superheated by the sun. A pump in the house pulls the liquid down into a drain back tank, which then feeds it into a water heater. The superheated liquid passes through the water heater by means of a copper coil, inadvertently heating all of the water in the tank in the process. But it isn't done there. Some of the liquid coming down from the thermal panels also passes through a separate closed loop, beginning at these cutoff valves, where it enters the concrete floor. Here it flows through tubing just beneath the concrete surface, creating heat that radiates up the floor to warm the interior of the house. So, everything from the hot water used for showers, to the warm air heating the home, is created by just these two panels on the roof in the liquid-filled tubes that they contain. Other than the pump on the wall, there are no moving parts in this system. It's just liquid going about its business flowing through pipes. It's incredible. Logan says every time he steps into the shower, he thinks, I can't believe I'm not paying for this hot water. And as it turns out, he's not paying for the water itself either. The fifth thing you have to know about Logan's homestead is that it contains an ingenious water collection system. As Logan says, if you have a roof, you have a way of collecting water. All of the water his family uses for drinking, showering, and even watering a portion of their crops comes from this cambered metal roof above their heads. See, rainwater flows down the roof into a gutter at the back of the house and then gets channeled into a vortex filter. It's this black five gallon bucket you see here. As water spins through the vortex filter, it passes through screen walls, getting separated from leaves and other organic matter in the process. The leaves fall out of one port, but the water flows into the collection tanks in this silver housing. Here it passes through a basket strainer and a surge tank, and then slowly drains through a biological sand filter, which cleanses the water to an incredible level of purity. Other than a trace amount of sodium and calcium, both of which are good for you, the water that comes out of this process is totally pure H2O. But Logan wasn't satisfied with only collecting as much water as these drums could hold. What if there's a drought or a disaster? He wanted an amount of stored water that could see him through severely dry times. Which brings us to our sixth point, and one of the coolest things I've ever seen on a residential property, the cistern. Fully filtered water stays at the house, but water in the surge tank, collected during heavy downpours, leaves the collection system altogether and travels by buried pipe to this structure in the side yard. To a passerby, this thing probably looks like a storage shed, but a closer look will reveal an engineered concrete sink that provides not one, but two separate 5,000 gallon water storage tanks. That's 10,000 gallons of potential water storage, more than the average American family uses in a whole year. The empty one you see here is just a 5,000 gallon standby. The active cistern is housed beneath this small building and covered by a suspended concrete floor. You can watch as Logan pulls back a metal hatch to reveal the 3,200 gallons currently in storage. Should he ever need more than this tank holds, he can just flip a switch and begin filling the secondary tank. Or if he wants to clean this primary tank, he can drain it into the secondary temporarily and not lose any collected water during the process. Never want to miss an opportunity. Logan used the concrete structure of the cisterns as a platform to build a large, tidy storage space above. I mean, why not? The 8 inch thick concrete walls provide a perfect foundation for a structure of this size. As usual with Logan, two things are accomplished at once, and all it costs are some reclaimed doors and windows, sheet metal, and lumber. And would it surprise you at all to find that Logan never spends a cent on lumber? Ambling right along through his property, we come to the seventh thing that you need to know about Logan and his business. Logan mills his own lumber. I mentioned that a hallmark of green construction is using what's at hand. 
Logan's Construction Company puts that concept to practice by turning the trees they clear from a job site into the lumber that they'll use for building the house. He employs his diesel-powered sawmill to render raw wood into framing lumber and even hardwood trims for his project. For instance, the posts and beams of Logan's house were made from large timbers he milled himself. Logan harvested the wood on the property months before building, then sticker stacked it to allow the wood to dry. Later, when it was seasoned to a lower moisture content, it was ready to build with. But for trim wood, he even goes a step farther. Logan custom builds many of his own cabinets and doors, like you see here in his own kitchen. It's beautiful stuff, but these sensitive hardwoods need more attention than mere framing lumber. For this, Logan turns to his very own solar wood kiln. Here is oak, poplar, and other hardwoods can go through the process of slowly drying out without cracking or checking too badly. The solar kiln is built like a greenhouse. It traps heat from the sun as it pours down through the transparent roof. Then, solar-powered fans in the beam overhead move air from higher in the kiln down through the lumber stacks and kicks it out the bottom vents of the door. This keeps moisture released by the wood from hanging out for too long. The process typically takes one to three months. Hickory and walnut are a favorite combination for Logan, and it's not hard to see why. On the open market, you can easily pay thousands of dollars just for the wood in these cabinets. Logan pays nothing but a little diesel for the sawmill and time. And as you pan around the yard, you come to the eighth and final thing you need to know about Logan and his home. Like many proud homesteaders, he produces much of his own food. From the apiary in the yard, to his pear, apple, and cherry trees, and even medicinal plants like the echinacea, Logan's small property produces upwards of 50% of everything his family consumes. And much else can be bartered or traded for. It gives the place an idyllic, fruitful look, even in the dry spell we're currently facing. A greenhouse attached to his home, and a unique composting system help repair, maintain, and fertilize the numerous crops he has in production at any given point in time. Logan knows as much about horticulture as he knows about construction, and it shows in the complexity and interconnectedness of his crop production. For instance, this composting system is very interesting, since it's intimately tied to the sewage and waste collection system in the house. But, I'll let Logan elaborate on those things in his future videos, because he can explain it way better than I can. As I wrap up this video, I say with true conviction, please do yourself a favor and subscribe to Logan's channel. This guy's a natural teacher. The stuff we'll soon be instructing on is not only extremely interesting, it also represents the cutting edge of sustainability science, homesteading, and green construction. And you'll get free access to all that in his upcoming YouTube videos. The channel's tiny now, but it's gonna boom, I guarantee it. As for me, I'm really glad I got to make this video and see these things firsthand. Please post questions down in the comments and thoughts and opinions as well. I want to hear it all. As always, thanks for watching The Honest Carpenter, everybody, and I'll see you next time.